Now let me just get into the chat and see if this is any better. Okay, can you hear me? It's working. Okay, so it's not as pretty. I don't have chat on screen anymore. So, uh, good. Okay, so let me just make sure that this pen works. See if we can draw. Everyone says it's working, that's good. Let's just see if the pen works and then we'll be good to go. There's lots of stuff to review, so we'll review it. Let's see. Perfect, and it erases, perfect. And you can see it, I think so. Let me just watch the lag to make sure it writes. Okay, good, perfect. Sorry about the delay, um, technical issues, but now we're here. So, uh, so I'm gonna start uh, with some questions that people had sent in via email. Um, and then from there we can go, I know, um, uh, I think someone had mentioned in chat that they wanted to go over paired samples t-test, so that's good too. But I'm going to start with uh, Pearson's R, so correlations. Oh yes, Nancy, yes, we will go over that. Okay, so let's start, let's just start at the beginning. This is the first email that was sent to me yesterday, so I'm just going to kind of go in chronological order. Uh, this is by, by Nisha. So her question is, uh, Pearson's R is always going to be between negative 1 and 1, right? Uh, those are absolutes and reflect what kind of relationship they are, I guess. Okay, so let's talk about that. So R, remember, R is the sum of Zx times Zy divided by the number of pairs you have, right? So when you want to say that two variables are related to each other, you have to convert your raw scores into Z scores, which will be given to you. You multiply across the two variables. So uh, the example we did in recitation was um, uh, height was one variable and length of a, of, a, of a race was the other. So like if you finish it in eight seconds, you're faster. And if you finish it in 10 seconds, you're slower. And so the question was, is height and speed measured by how fast you finish this, this race? Are they correlated, right? So you had to convert height into Z scores, convert uh, length of race into z scores divided by number of pairs. So uh, Nisha's right in that r will exist somewhere between negative 1 and 1. 0 is a special place in this, in that 0 is the position where uh, you would say there's no uh, linear relationship. So I say that specifically linear because if you look at you know, some sort of graph like this, where you have uh, a y-axis and an x-axis, you would say y and x are related, but that relationship's not linear. It's curvy linear or parabolic or, um, so this won't be represented in a correlation, um, even though in fact x and y are related. So if you have an r of zero, that means they're not linearly related. Um, an r of negative one is a perfect uh, inverse correlation, so, um, or in, um, I guess indirect correlation or inverse correlation in that when you, one variable goes up, the other goes down. So if we had an R of negative one here, let me just use this reminder, um, you'd have a relationship that looked like this, where as X increases going from like zero to 10, Y would decrease going from 10 to zero. So that'd be an R of negative one. Um, if you had an R of positive one, it would be the opposite. As one goes up, the other equally goes up. So it would look like this, where this is X and this is Y, where they both start off at zero and they both wind up at 10, going up equally with each other. Um, and then, so, the other question that Nisha had was that the sign is what's telling you about that relationship. So a negative correlation where you have like negative 0.5 or negative 0.3 or negative 0.8, that's always saying you have some inverse relation like that. So whereas one is the strongest relationship, um, you, you know, where it's like this, 
You could have one that's like this, where it's less strong and even less strong. They're all negative in that as x goes up, y goes down. Um, if you have a correlation of this could be like 0.5 and this could be like 0.3, they're both negative, of course, then um, the, the value of the number signifies kind of the, the strength of that correlation and the sign is the direction of that correlation. Okay, um, Gina, I will go through that. I will get to it uh, after I go through the ones that were emailed. I'm just trying to go chronologically. So um, I will kind of take a broader view of kind of the things that uh, we went over. And I think we'll hit all of them even before that. So I will organize it uh, so you see it that way. Um, let's see. So Taylor sent me an email today and asked uh, if there's any specific things we need to know conceptually about one-way paired samples, factor ANOVA. If so, go over them. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a vague question, so I, I'm only going to give a vague answer. Um, conceptually, I mean, they're all kind of very different, right? Like a paired samples t-test, oh wait, Alexa has a question about correlation. The sign is the direction and the number is the strength. Yeah, so if it's a negative uh, correlation, that means that as one var variable goes up, the other goes down. Um, if it's a positive one, it means they both go up at the same time. Uh, the number from zero to negative one or zero to one is how strongly that is. So um, if you, let's see. Uh, okay, good, perfect. So conceptually, you know, ANOVA and correlation and paired samples t-test are kind of very different. Um, so I guess I'll draw it out like this. We have correlation. We have um, paired t-tests, and then we have ANOVA. And I'm going to clump both uh, single sample or single variable and two variable ANOVA into the same thing because they kind of they're more similar to each other than they are to anything else. So remember that a correlation is just looking for you know, relationship, uh, between two variables. Like intuitively, you know that height and weight are related to each other, right? That the taller someone is, typically the heavier they'll be. They're positive related to each other. So you can show that in a correlation. Um, things can be related to each other, um, strongly or weakly. Uh, and then you can you can uh, see that when you calculate Pearson's R. A paired samples t-test is when you're looking at two groups that are related to each other, so they are correlated with each other. So here, this is just like an exam one, like if you're looking at independent samples t-test, except that assumption of independence is no longer uh, a valid assumption to have. So here you have like, two samples and uh, your question is are they different that's like kind of what you're looking for when you do a t-test are these two groups different from each other you know and the way you find that is you know uh, you take the mean of one, subtract the mean of the other, and you divide it by the uh, measure of variance for this test, which is the standard error of difference. And that's where the you know exam two material comes into place, is that you calculate the standard error of difference a little differently. You take into account that these two samples are correlated with each other. So uh, in the equation for that, if I can just kind of steal this bit over here is, uh, that's not gonna be enough space at all. Um, remember this equation, so SED is the standard error of the mean for group one squared plus the standard error of the mean for group two squared 
minus 2 times r times SEM1 times SEM2. I know I'm running out of space. I'm sorry about that. It's extremely long. And this is all under the square root. Right, so here is where you're saying, ah, there is a relationship between my two groups. So uh, you can account for that. And like I say in recitation, um, what does that do conceptually to your variance? Like if those two groups are related, are they, it, does that increase the variance overall or decrease it? So if you look at this equation, you think about the numbers, you having an R of 0.5 or an R of 1, that's going to wind up decreasing the overall variance. It's going to be easier to find a significant difference. It's going to be easier to find a T value that is larger than the critical T value given your degrees of freedom. So um, conceptually, I think that's very important if you think about um, why is it important to take into account that these two groups are related? So a lot of longitudinal tests that you'll look at, things like pre-tests and post-tests, let's say you want to know if, uh, like, Tylenol has some headache-reducing effect, you can take a group of people who have headaches and rate their level of head pain. So the whole group gets a pre-test, a pre-Advil, pre-Tylenol test of head pain. They rate themselves. Uh, then they all get drug, and then later they all get a second test um, on head pain. So you can imagine that people who are much more sensitive to pain overall, they may rate themselves as having high head pain in the pretest, and they may still be higher in head pain than their than their other people in the group. So you have to you have to consider that people are more similar to themselves across time than they are uh, similar to other people. So that's what that relationship, that correlation in a paired samples t-test is doing. It's taking into account that people are similar to themselves and will test similar to themselves as you test sequentially over time. Um, so I guess those are some conceptual points to make on the paired samples t-test. And for the ANOVA, I'm going to give myself more space because the ANOVA is quite different since now we're looking at more than two groups. We're looking at IVs with multiple levels. So remember, ANOVA is looking to see if uh, an IV has some sort of effect, given that the IV has more than two levels. So the example I always give in class, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it by now, is uh, if you're looking at height, I'm just going to use H because I spell it wrong all the time. And remember, the y-axis here is frequency. Um, you can take the height of all first graders, and you'll get some distribution of height, right? Some first graders are taller, some first graders are shorter, and then you take a height of eighth graders and a height of ninth graders. Uh, Moira, that's true, yes. Right, so you have, now you have height, which is an IV, right? This is your independent variable. And it has three levels, first grade, eighth grade, and uh, ninth grade. So if you want to know if grade, I'm sorry, height is your DD, whoops. Um, if I want to know if, no, this is your IV. Height is your DV and grade is your IV. Excuse my, uh, I haven't eaten yet, so I'm a bit foggy. Same reason why I don't spell height. Right, so you have three levels of your IV, which is grade. You have height, which is your outcome. Uh, you want to know if grade predicts height. So when you do your F test, it says you get a significant F. You say, yes, grade does predict height, but then you don't know uh, which grades are actually different from each other. Is it that uh, eighth graders are shorter than ninth graders? Is it that first graders are shorter than eighth graders? So your F test is then only giving you uh, if that IV has some effect, if it has some predictive ability. Once you have uh, three or more levels, you then have to do 
a Tukey's HSD post test. You have to then go through and find what mean difference is enough to say that those two levels are different and then do mean differences for every mean that you have. So uh, conceptually in ANOVA, first of all, is looking at uh, IVs that have more than two levels. Uh, usually the strength of ANOVA comes that you can do uh, IVs with more than two levels. The other thing is that it's all about variance, right? If you look at, that's what the V in ANOVA stands for, variance. If you look at the F equation, is the mean square between divided by the mean square within, right? So if you just think about what would make a big value of this, having a big mean square between would make a big value, right? The big numerator means big F. Uh, or if you have a small mean square within. If you have a small mean square within, that would also generate a big F relative to your mean square between. So if you look at this graph, what those things are telling you is this. The mean square between is giving you the overall kind of level of variance across height. So regardless of grade, if you just took all of the students you measured the height of, lumped them into one distribution, you would wind up with an overall distribution, something like this, right? So you have a mean that's here, and you have some standard deviation. So, you know, with the average distance from any point to the mean. So you have some standard deviation. This measure of variance of this overall distribution is this mean square between. That's this. It's telling you kind of how much spread there is across height in total, overall. The mean square within is a measure of how much variance there is within grade. So that's just like the standard deviation here. So you have some mean and there's some level of variance within grade. So you can imagine like uh, if you were to look at maybe seventh grade, when people, when children start going through puberty, you're going to have some kids who hit it earlier and some kids who hit it later. So growth spurts are going to be happening. And so you're going to imagine probably bigger variance in those grades in height. So that's here. That's this standard deviation. So what the ANOVA is looking at conceptually is the relationship between overall of, with all your measurements, this kind of grand variance, this mean square between, how much bigger is that than your mean square within, than the amount of variance you have within the levels of your IV? So if I can just draw one more graph, I'll, I'll stop harping on this for now and then go to a different question, but let's take it to an extreme. So let's say... Um, so this is an example that my wife told me, and I would feel remiss not to add it since she's sitting in the room. So, let, that's her. She's she's playing video games right now. Um, so let's say uh, an alien wanted to know uh, if there were differences in height between three different planets that had different alien races on them. So, on one planet, every species or every member was the exact same height. Let's call that 30 inches. So we have like a thousand people or a thousand species, whatever we're measuring, everyone is 30 inches. Then they go to another planet and on that planet, just trying to pick different colors, on that planet they measure a thousand beings that they find and they're all 31 inches all of them and you also measure a thousand you measure a lot of them and they're all the same height so here these two numbers are very close to each other so if you looked at your f equation your mean square between which right because this distribution this overall distribution is going to be very small right it's just like that this is pretty small, so I'll just say small, as we say it on the internet, small. But your mean square between 
Uh, your mean square within, excuse me. The variance within group is like almost zero. I'm not going to say zero because you can't divide by zero. Bad things will happen. But it's like really, really, really small. And so that means even though you have very little mean square between, you can still differentiate a difference between these two species because they have extremely, extremely low variance within, an extremely small mean square within, right? So if you look at this fraction, if this was like a difference of one inch, and then this was 0. 0.00001, your F would be like 10,000. It'd be so big, so easy to find a difference between these two groups. So let's just look at the opposite of that really quick. So that's when there's, there's absolutely no variance. Everyone is the same height. There's no within group variance. There is a little bit of between group variance. You can find an effect. So let's just say there was a lot of variance within group. Let's say we measured a species and they had a lot of variance. No one was the same, well, some people were the same height. They were at the mean median mode. It's still normally distributed, but very fat, big snare deviation. Big snare deviation. Then you go to another planet and you measure and they, their mean is different, but they also have a big snare deviation like that. So here's their mean, here's their snare deviation. So here you have a lot of overlap. So even though there's a difference in means, even though you know they are not the same, that given the amount of real estate they exist in here, given their mean square between, they have a very big mean square within. So here, even though this is, you know, big, it kind of spans the whole screen, this is also big, which means that the F is going to be not really impressive. It's going to be hard to find a difference. So when you have a lot of uh, variance within group, right, so mean square within, or sum of squares within, um, unless the mean square between, or the, you know, the sum of squares between, that variance that's measuring the overall difference, the overall spread within your DV, then it's going to be hard to find an effect. I hope that conceptually makes sense about how it is the ANOVA generates uh, how, you, how you can use the F test and use ANOVA to find differences uh, in uh, levels of an IV when there's more than more than two. Okay, so uh, I know I went kind of on a tangent with ANOVA, but let's get back on track with email questions. Um, so uh, Taylor also asked, how do we find confidence interval for one-way factorial tests and paired sample? Well, I wouldn't worry about doing confidence intervals for in ANOVA at this point. For paired samples t-test, it's going to be the same as doing it for independent samples t-test. Just remember that uh, a confidence interval is uh, for a paired samples t-test or independent samples t-test, it's your mean difference, right? So it's m1 minus m2 plus or minus um, some crit value of t, depending on your degrees of freedom, times your standard error of difference, right? So this is telling you, um, so if, if your alpha was 0.05, this is saying like how far you have to go to find the boundaries for 95% of your observations. And then uh, the SED is telling you kind of how much variance there is, right? So how much spread is there in your distribution? So this is the same as in test one. Test one, question four, I think it was, had an exact question like this. The paired samples t-test, you would do it the exact same way, except your standard error of difference is taking into account that you have a correlation involved. So just to make sure that that was covered, there you go. Okay, next question. Um, the formula to calculate R when we do a paired samples t-test. So the R in a paired samples t-test 
is the same as Pearson's R, right? So I may have skipped there for a second, I apologize. But uh, the R that you're calculating is the same R. So remember that Pearson's R is just this, um, the sum. So that's sum of zx times zy divided by the number of pairs of observations. So you can also think about that as the number of subjects. So I know this came up in recitation a couple of times. What are the pairs you're actually looking for? And it's pairs of observations. So like if I was looking at uh, height, I'll, again, I'll just use h and then speed. I kept this separate for a reason, um, like that. So I have like 50 inches, 60 inches, uh, 72 inches, that's six feet, that's reasonable. Speed, I have like five miles per hour, uh, eight miles per hour, 10 miles per hour, right? So now it's hard to compare these because they're in different units. So then you would find the z values. So this would be like z of height, and this would be z of speed. Now these will be given to you on the exam, but what you would do if you were doing it in real life and it wasn't being given to you, remember the z is just your value, x, minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So you could take 50 inches, minus it from the mean of height, divided by the standard deviation of height, and that would give you the z for 50 inches. So let's just throw numbers in here and say this is uh, exactly one, this is a z-score of one, so it's, or we'll call it negative one because it's below the mean. We'll say this is gonna be 0.25, and this is gonna be 1.2. So you would get values like this, and we'll say this is also negative one, and this is 0.25, and this is 1.2 as well. So you would get values like this in a table like this on the exam. You'll have raw scores, you'll have Z scores. But then you have to calculate Pearson's R. Now it could be that you wanna know some sort of t-test involving these things, and you would need this correlation to then factor into your standard error of difference that is possible. Um, so then here what you would do is you would calculate the z of height times the z of speed. So here is negative 1 times negative 1, so that's 1. 0.25 times 0.25 is 0.125. Uh, 1.2 times 1.2 is um, 1.4. I don't know, I'm doing it in my head. Um, so then once you get all of these, you would add them all up. So that's like 2.525. And you would divide it by the number of pairs, which here we have three, right? We have one here, 50 and 5. We have one here, 60 and 8. And we have one here, 72 and 10. So those are the pairs of observations that this equation is talking about. But see, you can also think about it as number of subjects. So I have three people who I measured their height and their speed. So just uh, you know, think about how both relate. So I don't want you to get too constrained in being like, I need to find pairs and not subjects. If you see subjects and that makes more sense to you, you can say, oh yes, their height and their speed. Their height and their speed, their height and their speed, there's three of them. That's fine, but then again, it's always gonna be pairs of observations I have an observation for height and an observation for speed. So even though I have six total observations, that's across two different variables, so I have three pairs. So here, it'd be 2.525 divided by three, and that would give you some decimal. So that is how you would approach just a straight correlation question if it was to come up. Or if you first had to do, if say you knew that two groups were related, or you had a test if two groups are related, um, and you want to then do a paired samples t-test, you'd have to do this first, find the correlation, uh, do a significance test. Remember, this will give you some R, but then you have to then compare that to a critical value of R, 
and either fail to reject or reject the null hypothesis that a correlation uh, exists. So the, the null is that there's no correlation, so either fail to reject or reject that null hypothesis, and then move on. So um, remember, if a correlation like this is appearing in some sort of paired samples t-test question, you have to fully go through the correlation first, either fail to reject or reject the null hypothesis, and then move on. So don't just like find an R value and then go into a t-test. Find an R value, find the critical value of R based on your degrees of freedom, compare them, make some sort of judgment call on the null hypothesis, make a statement, say like, you know, there's probably a relationship between the two groups, the same way you, you would approach any other question on the exam, and then move forward. So don't skip any steps if it's like a first part of a two-part question that's ultimately a paired samples t-test question. Make sure you take it slow and methodically and really resolve everything first with the correlation before you go into the t-test. Okay. Let me just check my email again. Um, okay, so now let's go into the chat questions. So paired samples t-test. Nancy, did I cover it enough for you or would you like me to go over it again? I know we kind of touched on it a few times since when you first asked, kind of covering other things. Um, so just let me know. Let me see what other questions there are. Um, can you show how to derive the sum of squares between and the sum of squares within? Yeah, uh, Samantha, I can do that. You're not going to be asked to do that on the exam. Um, so I kind of want to not give it too much time of the review since it's more of a academic demonstration than a functional demonstration, but I will do it since I do think it's important. Um, okay, so let me just go through the, I'll go through the paired samples t-test just one more time, just from beginning to end, just to kind of show how each piece falls into place. And then Samantha, you can, uh, think about, uh, the sum of squares derivation. I can still do it, but um, I don't want to uh, give you so much extra material that ultimately won't be functional. Um, Jasmine, if we fail to reject the R, we would use zero for the t-test? Yes, that's right. So that part of the equation in the standard error of difference technically is always there. So remember that Here's your equation. Standard error of the mean one squared plus standard error of the mean two squared minus two R SEM one, SEM two. So for independent samples T test, so for independent samples, this value is always zero, right? So if that value is zero, this whole thing cancels out into zero. So technically, that part of the equation has always been there. So if you fail to reject the null for r, you would use zero. And then if you use zero, all of this goes away, and then you're just left with this, which is what you used for the normal independent samples t-test on exam one. Now remember, this test is not, uh, um, it's not cumulative, so um, make sure you're really, really sure if you're going to fail to reject the null in a question like this, because then the whole rest of the question is from exam one. So uh, make sure you're really, really sure, double check your work before you move on. But that said, that doesn't mean that can't happen. I have not studied the exam, so I don't know what Dr. Kiliansky has put on there. So just be sure in what you're doing. Make sure you go through all of that and make sure you're doing the right thing when you do it. Um, so Moira, I would just say that you would explain it the same way you would explain any other failure to reject the null hypothesis. You would just say, uh, you know, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. There's probably no relationship uh, between variable one and variable two. 
right? Because since, since you're dealing with uh, an alpha level of 0.05, there's always a chance that you're making the wrong decision, right? It's just, uh, it's a decision kind of, it's a behavioral thing that we do in that we decide that this is the cutoff, therefore we will accept or reject the null. But over the long run, there is an error rate to worry about. So I would just explain the null the same way you would explain the null any other time. Uh, we failed to reject, there probably is not a relationship between these two, you know, given the data that you have. Um, okay, so Jasmine, I answered that. Nancy feels okay with the covering of pair samples t-test, okay? Because really, this, what, what's up there on the screen right now, this is the difference between the paired samples t-test and the independent samples t-test is this part here. With the star. Moira, when we reject the null, okay, so I, I mentioned that, Jasmine, okay. So, um, I just want to say, are there any other questions? Oh, here we go. Should we explain Pearson's R in a problem that is mainly asking for the difference between two sample means? Um, I would make sure to explain it, yes. So even if the question is about two sample means and there is a correlation involved, I would still throw in that sentence that explains that finding um, to say, uh, we reject the null hypothesis. There probably is a relationship between variable one and variable two. Um, and you know, and then that's, that's good. Or there is a, a positive relationship. Make sure it's directional when you do these things. There is a, a, a positive relationship between variable one and variable two, and then move on. Yeah, I, I would do that because uh, if he does write a question like that, you know, he's also testing your, he's using one question to test two different things. So approach it as if it was two diff different questions. Do the correlation, do the same steps as we've been doing for exam one, do the hypothesis test, make sure it's clear, give kind of a one sentence summary of the finding, make sure that's clear, and then move on into the t-test using that value for r that you calculated. And then if the, with the t-test, it's the same thing, it, uh, fail to reject or reject the null and explain that uh, in a, a sentence or two. So just uh, don't take any shortcuts. You have the whole period to do the questions. So just you know work through them methodically um, the same way you did in exam one. I think that'll be uh, a route for success. Okay, so any other questions um, before I just, I'll, I'll do a derivation for the sum of squares. Um, so I just wanna make sure that uh, you guys have any other questions. You can ask any other questions you want and then I'll go into them. So I'll just give you a second while I review my notes for sum of squares so I don't tell you the wrong thing. Now I think the reason why he says you should know about it conceptually is because it relates to standard deviation, right? The whole thing is variance. Variance, variance, variance. So since ANOVA is all about variance, the sum of squares is going to all about variance. Oh, here we go, Jasmine. So we only have to do two key HSD tests when there are more than two levels and we reject the null. Yes, that's correct, correct. And conceptually, I'll tell you why. If you only have two levels, where's the camera I'm looking at? This one. If you only have two levels and you find a significant F, like you reject the null with your F test and you have two levels, it's telling you there's a difference between those two levels. If you have three levels, what it's telling you is there is a difference between levels, but since there's more than two, you don't know if it's between A and B and not B and C, or if there's a difference between all A, B, and C, or just B and C and not A, there's more possibilities when you have three or more levels. When you only have two levels and you find a difference, it must be a difference between level A and B. So you could do a two keys test if you have two levels. I would bet you a thousand dollars that the mean difference between your two levels would be more, would be a greater value than your two keys HSD because that should always be the case if you're rejecting the null and you have a two level IV. So, uh, you know, it would be a waste of time to do it. You could do it. Like if you do it now, show for yourself that if you have two levels and you do a mean difference, it'll always be bigger than the two keys value for the honest significant difference. Uh, just to show you that doing it for a two level IV is redundant. If you get more information, I mean, you get very relevant information when you have three or more levels because then it tells you 
which levels are different from each other and which aren't if there are levels that aren't different from each other. So short answer, yes, to your question. Long answer, there's a reason why it's redundant with two levels. Okay, cool. So let me just show some of squares really fast. I'm not gonna do a whole thing, um, but so let's see. I just wanna make sure that everything is correct. 58 plus 96. Okay, so here. This is out of the book. It's on page 353 if you have the hardcover. It's in chapter 12 in the hardcover or chapter 10 if you have the soft cover. There's like a box. There's like a blue box um, that goes through this in, in vast detail. Moira. Yes, there is a null hypothesis for R. So the null hypothesis for R is that there, that there's no relationship between the two variables. So you calculate R, you then compare it, you have to find a critical value for R in the, in the table in the back of the book, then you compare your calculated value to the critical value. And if your calculated value is bigger than the critical value, you would say, I reject the null. I, there probably is a relationship between the two variables. And T, yes, T is the same as it was um, uh, in, in, uh, for the first exam. There's also a null hypothesis for ANOVA. Right, the null hypothesis is that um, that there's no difference between levels of IV. And so when you find F and your calculated F is greater than the critical value of F, you're saying, I reject that null, and there is a difference between levels of IV. If you have more than if you have three or more levels, then you have to figure out, okay, where is there a difference between levels? If you only have two levels, then you know the difference between those two. Nancy, do you know if there's tutoring this Sunday for this class? I don't because I don't have any crossover communication with the people who do the tutoring. Um, I imagine there is, but your peers would know more than I do. So I would ask them. Hopefully someone in chat, if you know and you're planning on going, please do tell Nancy if it exists or not. So let's just go through this real quick because we're running out of time. But I want to show you that it's related to standard deviation. So um, Moira, thank you for helping Nancy with that. Okay, so... This is, on, this is out of the book. So here we have diet under 2,000 calories, and this is diet over 2,000 calories. And then we have exercise and no exercise. And so uh, let me see if I can get a thinner pen. Is that possible? Like this. Okay. So you have values here, 10, 12, 14, 12, and 10. So this is just your raw data. So this is whatever they're measuring. I don't even know. Um, this is percentage of body fat. So that's what your DV is. So that's what these numbers actually are. Um, 20, 22. Uh, so hopefully you have your textbook and you're looking at this with me because it'll make more sense if you're following along. 16, 14. And then 22, 24, 24, 22, 24. Okay, right, so the hypothesis here is that um, people who have a diet over 2,000 calories will have higher body fat, and that people with exercise will have lower body fat, and that maybe there's some interaction between a high-calorie diet and no exercise, maybe. Okay, so we want to get sum of squares, right? So what does that sound like, sum of squares? Well, it sounds like we're going to square something, and then we're going to add it, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So the first thing you do is that you square all your observations. So we're just going to put the labels down here. These are your raw observations. So like this is what you measured. And then we're going to square them. So this is 100. And this is 144. And this is 196. And this is 144 again. 
and this is 100. And so you do this for all of them. So let me just write it out real fast. 256, 324, 400, 484, 400. So all I'm doing right now is just squaring the observations, right? So 12 times 12 is 144, um, 196, 225, 256, 196. Now remember, there's a step like this in standard deviation as well. In standard deviation, first you take the difference of your observation minus your mean, and then you square that. So while it's not the same, this is a similar step. You're taking some measure of your raw score and then squaring it. So I just want to draw that parallel as we move forward. 576. Okay, so all of this is is just the square of your raw score. So raw squared. Okay, so then guess what you guess what you do? Sum of squares, you sum them. So the sum of this, the sum of this is six eighty four. The sum of this is eighteen sixty four. The sum of this is ten seventeen, and the sum of this is 2696. Now remember, in standard deviation, you after you square the differences, right, from x, I'll just write it out. Here, remember, you have x minus m squared. You take the sum of it, you divide it by n, and you take the square root. That's standard deviation. So far, we've squared our observations, and then we sum them together. So sum of squares is a very close representation to a measure you also do when you calculate standard deviation. The reason I keep bringing it up is because they're both measures of variance. Okay, so then what you have to do is, where is it? You have to then, the sum of squares between, Maybe. All right, so they also name these. Um, so like up here is A, and then this is B, then this is C, and then this is D. Okay, I know it's getting complicated because it is complicated. And then what you do is you wind up I have to calculate C too, huh? No. You also have to get the sum of everything else. We'll do that real quick. So the sum of this is 58. The sum of this is 96. The sum of this is 71. And the sum of this is 116. So now we have the sum of observations and the sum of squares. From that, you have to calculate C. C is something that we haven't really talked about in recitation. But basically C is the sum of X squared divided by N. So you add up all of these. That gives you 341. And you divide it by N, which is 20. And that gives you 5814. 4.05. So that's C, okay. And then you gotta do one more thing. You get the sum of squares total. The sum of x squared minus C. So that is, I'm running out of colors here. That is this number, this number, this number, and this number minus C. 
So you do 684 plus 1017 plus 1864 plus 2696 minus 5814.05. And for this example, that gives you a sum of squares of 446.95. So that is the total amount of between and within variance that you have, right? Sum of squares total is just the sum of the sum of squares within plus the sum of squares between. Okay, so I'm going to stop there because... From here, then you just have to add up different sums of squares across different IVs, exercise and diet, to then get sum of squares between, and then the sum of squares within is just the difference between sum of squares total minus sum of squares between. The point is, it's very complicated. You don't have to calculate it for the exam, but know that the relationship that exists here is similar to the relationship that exists um, in standard deviation. You're taking squares of... Uh, observations and dividing it by the sample size that you have. Like you see that in C right here. So you're getting a measure of how much spread there is, how much the observations uh, vary across your level of DV, right? So this is uh, percent body fat. So this is giving you a measure of how much spread there is in each group. And overall, across all the scores measured. So um, that's that. If you want to go into it really in detail, I really recommend following this example. Uh, it's So I don't have the soft cover version of the book. I only have the hard cover version. So it's on. it starts on page 352. And it's right after the chapter goes into factorial ANOVA. It spends five pages, four and a half pages, pages, or almost five pages, going through step by step from beginning to end, calculating sums of squares, which takes about three of those pages, and then does the factorial ANOVA. So I'd really recommend going through that if you want to get more in-depth knowledge of the sums of squares. Conceptually, it's related to variance. It's a measure of variance similar to standard deviation and standard error of the mean. So that's where it comes from. I don't want to go any further into it because I'm afraid I'm going to, everyone's going to glaze over and, and that'll be the end of that. So uh, any further questions before uh, I sign off for the evening? So remember that the review from last semester uh, for exam two is also available for my webs on my website. So uh, it's probably worth a review Maybe students from last semester asked a question that you didn't think of that is helpful. So it's about the same thing. It's like an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. So it's just on uh, nickfox.netliffy.com. Scroll down to teaching. And you'll see a link for exam two there. So um, watch that. See if any other questions came up. Maybe I did a better job explaining something then and not now. Um, but you know, the more material you can use to review, the better. Uh, the same material was covered in exam two last semester. So it should be directly relevant. Um, and I hope that helps. So obviously, if you have more questions between now and Tuesday or now and Thursday, shoot me an email. I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, if you want further help, I have my office hours on Monday. Oops. So office hours, Monday, 1 to 3, uh, till it. 429 and obviously like you know my recitation students come to this regularly which is excellent uh, but if you're not in recitation four or five you can still stop by that's fine um, if you have questions I'm not going to turn you away just because you're in someone else's recitation that would be mean 
And then if that doesn't work for you, let me know. Um, we can try to schedule a Skype call or FaceTime or something to go over a question if you're really having a problem or you're stuck on something. Just let me know what you need um, and I will try to be available for you. Um, I want to see everyone get 100 on this exam, so please do use me as a resource as you prepare. So good luck in your studying. Um, use each other as a resource. You know, make sure you're talking with each other. Someone might know ANOVA is better than someone else. So, you know, work together on getting through this. And if I don't see you on Monday for the office hours, I will see you Tuesday for the exam. So good luck and have a good weekend.